afraid of it. Um, so the 2015 special town meeting is now in session. Thank you for your patience as we wrap up some last minute um, details. The first thing that I'm going to do is read the return of the warrant. Pursuant to Chapter 39, Section 10 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and the Warrant adopted October 14, 2015, I have notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Nantucket qualified to vote in town affairs to appear at the times and place, and for the purposes within mentioned by posting said notification on October 20, 2015, at the stop and shop on Pleasant Street, the town and county building at 16 Broad Street, and upon the bulletin boards at the corner of Main and Federal Streets and Sias Hunsett Square. Sworn to under pains and penalties of perjury, Catherine Flanagan Stover, Constable. Okay. Now, because this is a special town meeting, we're going to just get right to business because I know everyone wants to vote and go home. We have seven articles. I am going to do what we call a call of the articles. The way this works is that if you want to discuss a particular article, when I call it out, you should say your name, and I'll put your name next to it. If there's an article that you don't wish to discuss, or where you agree with the recommendation of either the Planning Board or Finance Committee, then you should just let it go by. Um, on the two zoning articles, which are articles one and two, we will be um, voting in accordance with the Planning Board recommendation. On the balance of the articles will be voting in accordance with the Finance Committee recommendation. Before I call the articles, the Finance Committee did provide a comment on both Articles 1 and 2, and I'd like to read those into the record. So Finance Committee comment on Article 1. The Finance Committee recommends that the town meeting support the plan board motion under Articles 1 and 2, and further, that the Finance Committee recommends that the Board of Selectmen appoint a working group under Section 1.7 of the Memorandum of Agreement between the Town and Richmond Development, dated November 9, 2015, said working group to consist of at least two members of the Finance Committee, two members of the Planning Board, Finance Director, the Director of Land Use Services, and members of the public at large. The working group shall meet with Richmond Development and its consultants to work collaboratively on defining the scope of the fiscal impact report required under Section 1.7 of the Memorandum of Agreement. That is the Finance Committee's motion um, comment on both Articles 1 and 2. The Memorandum of Agreement was reached between the Board of Selectmen and Richmond Development this afternoon. Um, that document is available on the town website. Okay. <clears throat> so, any questions about the call of the articles? Yes. The Finance Committee um, comment. It's a comment, it's not binding, and it's not part of the actual motion. Okay. Article 1, Mr. Lowell, I think Mr. Lowell, you're calling Article 1 and 2. Okay. Article 3. Okay. Article 4. Sanders. Five, six, seven. Okay. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to go through that list one more time. And if no one calls articles three, five, six, and seven, then we will vote those now according to the recommendation of the Finance Committee as printed in the warrant. Mr. Lowell has called Articles 1 and 2. Article 3, 
as Andrews has called Article 4, or, excuse me? Oh, all right, Ms. Zoda, three, five, six. Yep, three and four. Ms. Zoda has called three, and Ms. Andrews has called four. So right now, one, two, three, and four are called. Five? Are you calling that, Mrs. Bond? Okay. Five. Six. Seven. Okay. Last call on Article 6 and 7. All right. Um, let's see. Neither Article 6 nor 7 requires a quorum. Article 7 does require a two-thirds vote. Article 6, a simple majority. When you vote, you be voting the Finance Committee's motion on both Article 6 and Article 7, a yes vote will adopt that motion, a no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor of the Finance Committee motions on Article 6 and 7, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Yeah. I declare that those are adopted by a two-thirds voice vote. Okay. So a few little housekeeping issues. Um, articles 1 and 2 are zoning articles. They do not have a quorum requirement, but they do require a two-thirds vote. Article 3 requires a 3% quorum, but a simple majority vote. Articles 4 and 5, because they involve borrowing, require a 5% quorum and a two-thirds vote. Based on the number of voters that we have, a 5% quorum is 437, a 3% quorum is 262. We currently have an excess of 600 voters in the room. Um, we also have some non-voters in the room. So, first of all, we have a non-voting section over here under the eaves. So if you're not a voter, if you're not otherwise allowed to be on the floor, you should be up with the other non-voters. But we have some non-voters who are here to speak on articles. I believe we have Jody Barrett, do we? Yep, Jody Barrett, the town um, housing consultant. Dave Arminetti from the Richmond Group is here. Uh, Let's see, Richard Webb was the architect from SMRT for the RL and Tom. On the fire station, we have the owner's project manager, John Lemieux from Vertex Companies. And we have the architects, Todd Costa and Michael McKeon from Castle Bowes Architects. Have I missed anyone? Okay. So with your um, consent, yes? I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Andrew? Andrew Bjork from Richmond. Okay. So with your consent, we will allow those people to speak when and if the time presents itself. Um, we have a procedures manual, Nantucket Traditions and Procedures, which supplements our meeting time. Which I have a Town meeting time is the official um, guide that we use for procedure. It's a little more user friendly than Robert's rules. Um, but we also have our own traditions and, traditions and procedures, and with your consent, I would like to adopt those for use at this meeting. Thank you. So because we have a quorum, I'd like to propose that we go backwards 
and start with Article 5. Um, Article 5 is on page 9 of the warrant. The Finance Committee motion continues on page 10. It is a positive motion. Move that the town appropriate $2 million to be expended by the town manager to supplement the previous appropriation made under Article 11 the 2015 annual town meeting to pay costs of constructing a new fire station at Fort Fairgrounds Road, including the payment of costs of professional services for design, permitting, architecture, construction, supervision, and other related professional expenses and any other costs incidental and related thereto, and that to meet this appropriation, $1 million shall be transferred from free cash, and the treasurer, with the approval of the selectmen, is authorized to borrow $1 million under Chapter 44, Section 7, Three of the general laws or pursuant to any other enabling authority to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore. Recognize the chair of the finance committee, Mr. Kelly, for the purpose of making that motion. So move, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Now, um, Mrs. Bollins, I think you call this. Um, whoops, can you either come down and get a microphone or wait for one to go around? <laughs> Sorry. Here's what town meeting time looks like, too, by the way, in case anyone cares. Now that I've read the uh, article more carefully, I just withdraw by asking to call it. Okay. I do wonder why they suddenly need two million more dollars, but I'm all right with that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else wish to be heard? Yes, Ms. Soto? I think that's a legitimate question. Could we know why that the cost has gone up considerably since we voted on this previously? Thank sure, you. certainly. I'm going to recognize our new fire chief, Chief Paul Root. Welcome. <laughs> We did. We looked at the design of the building. Um, we started off with what we 
we thought we needed down the road, and we cut back every square foot we could. Um, we cut just the minimum amount of offices to accommodate the staff we have. We cut the minimum square footage on the apparatus floor of the house the vehicles that we have. Uh, we certainly cut every square foot we can out of it, and as we go forward, we'll continue to cut, cut every dollar we can out of the design. Thank you. A follow up. So my follow up question is basically what you're saying is you want 17 million to build the fire station, but the bids might come in less than that. <laughs> that that's correct. Well, we would all hope that the bids come in less. Uh, we have no way of uh, seeing the future and knowing exactly what they're going to be. Like I said, there's been a dramatic increase in the last two months. Uh, there is a possibility that, that contracts will be over here for school and they'll bid lower if they're already over here. We, we certainly hope that's the case. But uh, at this point in time, we don't have enough money, given the current estimates, to go forward with the square footage of the building. Mr. Costa? Mm -hmm. I just want to make a couple things clear because I don't think everyone understands the process, and I know when I first became a selectman, I didn't understand it either. Um, when you bid a public project, it's not like building a home. You don't go out and get you don't go out and put the thing out to bid, and then and then go borrow the money or come up with the money. In a, in a government, in a town or a state project, you have to first have the appropriation in place, and then you put it out to bid. So when we drew the plans, we got an estimate from the architects and the engineers of what they thought it would cost, given the square footage cost at that time. Well, that square footage cost has gone up significantly. And we can't, we have to come back and reappropriate the money. We're not raising taxes for this extra two million. We've gotten this money from, well, we are slightly, right? One million is going on the appropriation, which, let me correct that. One million of it's coming from free cash, and this free cash isn't what free cash sounds like, but <laughs> it's not going to go on the tax levy. The other million is money that we are authorized to borrow. So it's not going to change your tax bill, but we, we can't continue forward unless we know we have enough money or feel we have enough money to put the bid out. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman here on the, on the end. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I guess the question if, would if be... If you could identify yourself for oh, the... Uh, Frederick McClure? Okay. Um, the question I guess that I would have would then, what, wh what are the odds that this is going to be coming in at the appropriation that we're, we're voting on tonight? And perhaps the engineers need to address that issue. And if you could identify yourself. Hi, John Lemieux from Vertex, uh, the owner's project manager. Uh, basically, what we're doing with the budget is looking at a lot of other projects and live data that's come in over the last few months, trying to project that forward a little bit and then apply the island factor to it as well and say, okay, if a public safety facility in situ it a month ago bid at about $500 a square foot, that's fire and police. Police stations are more expensive to build, so we would hope you know, just under 500. If you add the island factor, that gets us over 600, 630, 640. You multiply that 640 times a 22,000 square foot program, that puts you at four, just over 14 million. At a 5% contingency, that's $15 million for just construction costs. And then the other 2 million is for soft costs, architects' fees, furniture, fixtures, equipment, kind of everything else that uh, it would take to put the building together. I'm not sure that responded to the question. I said, what are the odds are that you're going to come in at that cost? We're hopeful that they will come in under that cost because other, <laughs> if we had a crystal ball, that'd be great. But the goal here is to try to set that budget higher than we think it's going to be. The goal is to always to come in under that budget on bid day. You know, what we've seen over the last four months is bids are coming in over. The estimators are having a tough time catching up. So what we've been going through the last few weeks here is trying to say, okay, what's that number? Well, 15 is not going to do it. You don't have enough 
to build that 22,000 square feet if the costs continue to escalate along the way. The process now, we're in schematic design. We've got about six drawings. We're figuring out the layout and the exterior. That program gets solidified and we move into design development. Before we do that, we get our first estimate. So if our target after tonight is 15 million, we'll have real estimate numbers two weeks from now and we'll see where we are. If we're over, we'll back off. Then we move ahead to design development, get, gets us halfway through. Then we'll do another estimate. Where's the number in relation to 15? More or less, if it's more, we'll back off again. And then we'll do it yet a third time right before bid. So we don't just go for 15 and design for six months with our eyes closed and, and hope for bid day. We're gonna go and check it three times along the way and try to back off if we have to each time if it comes in in excess of what's been appropriated. And so the final question would be, if, if it, the, the final bid comes in in excess of what we've appropriated, you have to come back for an additional appropriation? Theoretically, you would, yes. Thank you. Ms. Jordan? Hi, Lucille Jordan. Um, will, the new, will the new fire station be um, able to accommodate female firefighters? Yes. Great. <laughs> new career. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, up in the back, Mr. McGowan. Hello. Good evening, Madam Moderator. Town of Nantucket, it's very overdue that we have a new fireplace in this town. I know I said fireplace. It's very overdue. We have to have a new fire station in this town. We need it, every one of us do. I think that $772 a square foot for the new fire station is adequate, and we should vote for this and vote for it now. I'd like to call a question. You, you can't have your cake and eat it too, but I think we're ready to um, vote. A yes vote will adopt the Finance Committee's motion on this Article 5. A no vote will defeat the motion. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. That, I declare, has been adopted by a, a two-thirds voice vote. <laughs> Article 4. And you know, before I do that, I was very rude and I didn't introduce, as I was supposed to, the people who were sitting up here at the table facing you all. You probably know them all, but just in case you don't. Um, starting here at my right is the Board of Selectmen table. Rick Atherton, Matt Fee, Tobias Glidden, Don Hill Holgate, Bobby DaCosta, Town Manager Libby Gibson, Town Council John Giorgio, then the Town Clerk's table, Catherine Flanagan Stover, Nancy Holmes, then the Finance Committee, Jim Kelly. I'll never be able to do this in order. Um, John Tiffany, Joe Grouse, Steve Morey. I can't see. I can't see you because Mr. Morey's in the way. Um, Pete McEachern. Uh, let's see, David Worth, and Cliff Williams and Dr. Mulcahy. Then the planning board, Linda Williams, vice chair, Nat Lowell, chair, Barry Rector, um, my surveyor friend, Joe Marklinger, and that is everyone in the front. And then behind the curtain here, I have um, Mary and Al Navissimo, and they're the people who make all of this work. So. Okay, Article 4 is on page 9 of the warrant. I'm going to ask that you we waive my delightful reading of the Finance Committee motion. It is as printed in the warrant. And I'll recognize Mr. Kelly for the purpose of making that motion. So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. This was called by Ms. Andrews, who has 
an amendment, I believe, she would like to propose, which is to strike the word new from the Finance Committee motion so that it would read, and other related professional services for the construction of a facility for our island home. Is that your amendment, Ms. It Andrews? It is, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? That motion has been made and seconded. Ms. Andrews. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I apologize, uh, as you probably all know, I am recently Marie bereaved, but I am familiar with our island home intimately. And I know that a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into making the recommendations that we've been presented with at various forums. Uh, a lot of, I think, uh, still feel very strongly uh, that the um, that the views of the current facility are not replaceable in any way, and that what they provide for the residents, the staff, and the families, and I can speak as a family member that probably losing my mother was one of the most difficult moments of my life, and to be in a setting that is so connected to the life of the town, with boats going back and forth, and Merlin's perching in the tree over her head, and the great egrets and snowy egrets and other things in the marsh, um, that a value can't be set on that, but it is crucial to the care of our elders and ourselves when we become elders. So um, my feeling is that the committee that worked very hard and the architects who have uh, followed their lead uh, need to work with us more to get us to accept um, what they're proposing or some alternative. And that's the reason for the amendment. I know we need to spend the money anyway and work needs to be done. So it has to start for all kinds of reasons. I hope we won't have a huge long discussion, but I, I think this might do the um, uh, uh, crucial work of uh, satisfying those of us who want it to be where it is and uh, deal with the problems of the site. Thank you. Is there anything on just the amendment which is striking the word new? Okay. So a yes vote will adopt the amendment, a no vote will defeat the amendment. It does require a majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. That amendment is adopted. Okay, now on the main motion as amended by Ms. Andrews, is there any, Mr. McClure? Um. I realize this is a very emotional um, proposal and the, whole, the question of the Ireland home means a lot to a lot of people. So perhaps I'll be the devil's advocate. But um, the, the first, I have two points. The first point would simply be that the motion, as I read it, doesn't particularly talk to a, a site. So uh, how can you spend a million dollars to develop a site or, or, or a proposal for a site either at the current location or at some other location without designating what site that's going to be. I can't believe that the same building envelope would be uh, proposed for two different sites. The second, I guess, would be, um, and this is the most controversial part, would be is the town really should be in, in the business of being in the nursing home business. And I recognize that that's controversial, but look, just bear with me. Um, I was born in 1946. Uh, I'm a baby boomer. Uh, so I'm uh, of a generation who uh, are, might be in the near future in a nursing home. I hope not that soon. But so the question I would have is if we're, if we're, de if we're developing a site for 45 people, as I understand the current proposal, 
is do we really believe that that would necessarily be adequate uh, in the next 10 or 15 years? It may very well be that we're designing a site or a facility that becomes inadequate in terms of size. Uh, second, I recognize that, I, I believe that the current uh, island home operates at a deficit, which the town supports. So I would just simply throw out as an alternative, perhaps, that we should think about, is that perhaps there is a private developer or private uh, entity that would be uh, willing to have a nursing home uh, for whatever number of residents that we might foresee. Uh, and that not that we would propose to um, move anybody from the present site. I know there have been discussions about what would be due if we have to build on the present site, we move people off island or whatever. So my question would simply be, perhaps there through a private developer or private entity, somebody could build a site on a site uh, and, they, um, and, and that may work if the town were be willing to provide the same deficit spending that it's applying to the current home to a future home or sub subsidizing a, fut a developer for at least a, some period of time to make that doable. Thank you. My question. Okay. All right, so I see no, oh, Mr. Ray. Richard Ray, sorry. Private citizen, finally. <laughs> the yellow new up there is simply meant that a concentration should be made with regard to the local site. Perhaps more of a concentration on the local site. We've talked about relocating this building uh, to areas further inland. Phil Bartlett, was right, I think. You take care of the kids and the old folks. The rest in the middle kind of fall where they should fall. This is an old folks issue, and I'm pretty close. I think that facility down there, although may not be salvageable, it is certainly a property that could be reconstructed. When the hospital looked at moving its complete facility to a different part of the island, the town spoke loud and clear, I think, and basically said, no, you're going to have to work on the property that you have. And I think this is something that, that should happen here, too. Uh, I think it's a wonderful location. I think it offers a great deal for the residents of the facility to be able to, if it's all they can do, sit and watch the harbor. I, too, will probably have a room there at some point. And I want to see sailboats, and I want to see people scalloping. I do not want to see chipmunks and acorns falling out of a tree. <laughs> uh, please, uh, let's try to convince folks that maybe we really need to spend more time looking at that location. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no applause, please. Uh, way up in the back, uh, Miss Cartoon, and I think it is. Okay, uh, I'm Francis Cartonen, uh, and I, I have a uh, question about money, actually. Um, and it's a three-part question. Uh, so I'd like to know from what monies has or will um, SMRT architects and engineers um, be paid for the Our, Our Island Home Feasibility Study that was presented to the Board of Selectmen on October 7. Uh, how much? And will they be paid additionally from this $1 million that we're being asked to approve tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gibson? Libby Gibson, town manager. 
The first question, the source of funds, is the Our Island Home budget. The second, I don't have with me how much they've been paid or billed so far. And the third is to do the additional work that is required to move something forward for the facility is the appropriation that we're asking for. Okay. Ms. Goss? There is nothing here, um, uh, Victoria Goss, um, there is nothing here that says um, what, I mean, it, it says, okay, for the construction of a new facility or for, for the construction of a facility, but there is nothing here now that limits this to one site. There is nothing that, that, that guarantees or or strongly indicates that the majority of the islanders that I can hear um, prefer to have it at its present site. Um, I would like to suggest that we not pass this bill. I know I'm going to have raindrops on my head, but um, I would like to suggest that we not pass this bill until we get more specific information and more... Uh, more details about what could happen where we are now. And I know everybody thinks that costs money, but there are a lot of very, very talented people with ideas that, that, that don't necessarily, it, it doesn't have to cost money right now is what I am suggesting, is, is we can sit on this for another six months and wait and then at town meeting, in the spring decide a, with a little more understanding and knowledge. And if, if there's a majority of, of town department heads who think that this is really important in one way or another, then to sell it to us a little more strongly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barnes. John? OK, Curtis Barnes. My only question is, are we going to pick the site before we spend the million dollars, or are we just going to spend the million dollars and figure out how to fit it into the site? I would think we should pick the site, and then the million dollars would be well spent in designing to that site. Okay, so let's not, let's not have a pause because it just slows things down and Do you have someone up there? Yes, go ahead, Ms. Zoda, and then I'll come back to you, Dr. Butterworth. It's a little bit of point of information. The Island Home Services are elderly population, but I had a family member who was terminally ill, and he was only 50 years old, 55 years old, and he qualified for our Island Home. So it services a broad spectrum, and if you've ever been in that position, You'd be very glad that our island home sits where it is and afforded him that view. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Butterworth? Uh, George Butterworth, I would like to propose an amendment that this article specifies that the million dollars is to research a new facility at the current site. Okay. <clears throat> and if it doesn't, you know, if the million dollars and we're going to take a chance for that money. We're going to see what we can do at that site. Okay, Instead wait. of passing this, which is wide open. Just wait. So your amendment would be then to add, say, after a facility for our island home, you would add at its current site? Correct. Meaning the immediate area around it. Obviously not literally. Okay. All right, is there a second? Okay, now that's your motion. Did you want to talk about it or did you already say what you wanted to say? I, I think it speaks for itself. I think there's many, many of us here who would be very uh, upset to see it move from that site. You know, we went through this 35 years ago, all of you who, who were back here then, when the hospital wanted to move it up to their site and uh, which, by the way, would create real problems now with the hospital trying to expand. 
And, um, you know, it was a very emotional discussion. Would you rather be overlooking the graveyard or would you rather be overlooking the harbor? <laughs> and I got up and voted against the hospital, even though it's where I work, because I thought it was really important to keep it on the harbor. And so 35 years later, we're back dealing with the same issue, and I think that I, I want the same answer. I just think it's worth, you know, this represents exactly what Nantucket is. If you stick this off in the piney woods someplace, that could be located anywhere, any community. Uh, and uh, what's unique about this is I've never seen a nursing home in a location this incredible before. Okay. On the amendment only. Ms. Gibson? Thank you. We are struggling with this here in the town. We've done quite a bit of work about the current site. As Ms. Cartoonan has told us, we haven't done well enough with our public outreach. That's abundantly clear. If we limit this to the current site, there are so many other issues to deal with our island home. It's very complex. The current site, keeping the, the facility there, has a lot of ramifications to it. There are operational issues, there are regulatory issues, there are issues with keeping the current site operational, the current facility operational, why we would build a new facility. The residents would have to move for a period of time. That is going to be detrimental to some of those people if they are moved. We don't need a million dollars to look at the current site. We need funds to figure out how we are going to deal with this facility moving forward. We need a new facility somewhere. We need to look at current trends and how skilled nursing care has evolved. We probably don't need a million dollars for all of those things, but we need some funds to move forward and limiting it to the current site only is going to be problematic. We all would love to keep our island home where it is. But please believe us when we say that we are struggling with it and it has a lot of issues. One thing we heard at a forum we, we recently put on last week was people would like to know more about why we think the current site may not work. We would be happy to do that and look at the site more. If the voters believe that we should have a facility there, then that should perhaps go before the voters and we can decide how much we want to spend on, on a town-run facility. So I would ask you to please not vote yes on the amendment. Vote no on the amendment is what I'm trying to say. Mr. Kowacki? Yeah? Oh, I guess it is. Uh, Mike Glowacki. Uh, and I did go to some of the forums. I'm a little bit late tuning into this issue, uh, but uh, I mean, we all know it's deeply emotional. I, uh, what we heard at the forums and what we just heard now is if we do not vote for this amendment, having the focus be on the current site, the money is going to be spent telling us why it cannot be on the current site. And uh, we need to vote this amendment in order to fully evaluate the current site. Thank you. Thank you. On the amendment only. Ms. Soda? And is it correct that the town owns the land that the island home is on? Yes. So if the island home is not there, the town could sell that waterfront property. Is that correct? Just asking. Not, not without authorization from town meeting. It would take a town meeting authorization. Right, but the land would be empty and the town could sell it. With town meeting authorization, right. correct, yes. Okay, on the amendment only, yes. Greg Keltz, um, it's sort of a point of order. Is, is this not expanding 
this whole article, and I'm, I'm just curious on why you think it doesn't. <clears throat> I think it's contracting the article. That's because it's gone from anywhere to somewhere very limited. Mr. Glidden? This, this is on the amendment only, Madam Moderator. Um, this is against, I'd like to speak against the motion to change the article to move fix the location on a spot. I think it's something we can do to look into the location. I have two reasons for thinking this is an inappropriate location as much as I think it's a beautiful location. It's in a floodplain. It's not a safe place to have an island home. Maybe we can build a new one that's up taller if the voters think that's appropriate. Um, part of my job as being a selectman is to remind voters of the fiduciary responsibility that we have to be able to pay our bills. Kind of a rough back in the note shh analysis of this would tell you that a new facility is gonna cost about $40 million on this site or another site. Um, the Island Home operates at, you know, a three to $4 million deficit. We've got some funding from the state that doesn't look like it'll continue in perpetuity. So that's about $4 million a year. You amortize that out over 20 years, $80 million over 20 years, so it's $120 million. The Island Home sees about, on average, 60 residents a year. Due to turnover, 40 at a time, 60 in total. So that's about 1,200 residents over 20 years. It's $120 million for 1,200 re residents. I, as a young person, think there might be other ways we want to spend the last days of our lives. If we as a community vote that we want to spend those days of our lives at a facility, if we understand that's going to be expensive. I think we should vote for that. But also, we should fully understand that there might be other ways that we can spend the end days of our lives at home. And maybe there's other financial models that we can use to keep people at home where a lot of older folks really want to stay. I could be totally wrong. But I just want to get those points out there. I'd ask you to vote against this amendment. Thank you. So on the amendment only, Ms. Benz. I would like to ask if it is within the scope of the uh, motion, because it's not specifically mentioned, whether or not the charge to uh, complete this uh, evaluation will include the relative costs to build this structure uh, on alternative locations, or whether or not it is just a generic building project without regard to location. Is that within the scope of the RFP for this, to come up with essentially a cost of you know, a, a, a comparative analysis of the cost in either location. Yes, it, it is. is. Yes, it is. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, go ahead, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Nancy Wheatley, there we go. <laughs> uh, six rights landing. This, I'm, I'm a little torn about the, um, uh, about, about having this, uh, moving this to, to add its current site, but I think this is associated with, uh, there really is a lot of feeling about this among the community, and I was with a group of people last Saturday night, and we were talking about this. And what, I, I think what people are feeling is that when, um, when you hear, well, we just can't do it here, we have to go someplace else, the, the request that I'm hearing is we really have to understand what can be done at this site. And if it turns out that it's not gonna work for the future, then we, we, I think we can move on. But there's a feeling that there's just not enough attention to the fact that this is, a, this is an integral part of our community and it has, given, it has given comfort to so many people in this room. And we need to be sure we have, we have evaluated whether we can keep it there or not. 
Sure, it's, it's easier to do it elsewhere, but we really need to de determine what we can do with that site. So I was torn, but I say support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the amendment, um, there's a woman up in the back. Our island home. Um, one thing that we are, I'm against at its current site, me of all people, who enjoys that view every day. However, a lot of things that have not been said, Mr. Glidden did touch on it. We are biding our time. We sweat our time every time there's a hurricane. We're 12 feet above the floodplain. We're most vulnerable. It's a, not a good site as far as what's coming in the future of whatever climate change or whatever hurricanes are worsening, changing to trajectory. But the other issue is, is that I have sat through probably 100,000 interdisciplinary team meetings and what is important to the people of our island home is not the view. It's how they're cared for. It's the dignity in which they've been treated. They want their privacy in a private room, and they want things that are important to them, socialization, a proper meal, and for people to treat them with dignity and respect. And that can be done anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. OK, let's not do that. Yes, right here in the, if you could stand up, they'll hand you a microphone. Hi, Ron Bocage. Um, is it clear that the decision on siting will have to come before a town meeting, either at a special meeting or in the meeting in the spring? Does someone up here will have to answer that? So everyone at the select well, almost everyone at the selectman's table is saying yes. Mr. Right, DaCosta, so, do you want to? So there will be an opportunity to any, vote on where Any site, site any new facility, whether it's on the present site or somewhere else on Sherman Commons land or even a third option, will require an override. It'll have to come to this body, get a two-thirds vote, and then go to the ballot. Um, we can, if, if, if this this body decides that they want to only have it on this site, we can design it on this site. But it will probably cost more money than another site, and we will have to displace the residents of Island Home for a period of time. We can't, there's, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at this site, and we can't build on this site without demolishing the old building. There's just not enough land. The new regulations require a lot more space in the, in the facility than when it was built 30 years ago. And to have the private rooms and the dignity that Mrs. Ellis talks about, we'll, we'll need to use the majority of that footprint of that land. It's only two acres for this facility. So we'll have to take the old facility down and build a new one. So we can keep it here if you want, but just be prepared that we may have to ask the residents to leave for a little bit of time. Yep, up in the back. Wait. Hi, Mary Rich Rod. Um, it's my understanding that over the years we have had a number of plans drawn out for the island home. And I just don't want to see going through a million dollars of plans to have no changes made. So I do think that this should be kind of shelved until we have much better understanding of what we're doing. Thank you. Mr. Fee? I urge you to defeat the uh, amendment and support the article. Uh, if we're painted into a corner like this, we won't be able to uh, address some of the issues that we're talking about. Uh, I fear that if we're painted in this corner, we'll come back to town meeting in a year or two years and the number that Toby had, 120 million, I'm worried it's going to be 200 million, and people are not going to accept it. So, we're, you know, we're, I just, I'd be careful what you wish for. We're, I give you my word that I'll do everything I can to examine that part of the, you know, of keeping it where it is, but please don't uh, force us and make a decision that's going to 
turn out bad in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think on the amendment, we requires a majority vote. The amendment is to insert the words at its current site in the Finance Committee motion. A yes vote will adopt that amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The amendment is not adopted. Okay, now we're back on the Finance Committee motion as printed in the warrant as amended by Ms. Andrews was striking the word new. This does require a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. I declare that that is adopted by a two-thirds voice vote. Okay. Article 3. And while we're turning to Article 3, I want to mention I didn't go through time things at the beginning, but the basic time thing is on the main article, um, the first person or the person who called it or presented it gets five minutes. Everyone after that gets two minutes, except if it's your second time speaking, one minute. And I'd really ask you as we go along to respect those those time parameters. Um, Article 3 starts on page 8, continues on to page 9. The Finance Committee motion is as printed in the warrant. This requires a majority vote, a 3% quorum. I'm going to ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of the motion and recognize Mr. Kelly, the chair of the Finance Committee, for the purpose of making the motion as printed in the warrant. Mr. Kelly. So moved, Madam Moderator. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Uh, this was called by Ms. Zoda. I will go to you. Maria Zoda, 3 Diana Beach Road. I'm currently um, your um, CPC member at large, so because they are an applicant, I've been able to study the details of this large construction project at um, length. And everyone knows that it is a larger building on a bigger footprint with six dormers. I'm still personally weighing the pros and cons. And my reservations have to do with the fact that I really need to hear the town's commitment to this large long-term project that they're gonna absolutely support the Natural Resources Department for the long term with staff, budget, funding. Um, this is a very big facility. I think it's warranted and it's important, but I wanna hear from the town how they're gonna support our Natural Resource Department in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carlson? I hate to have you get all dressed up and not get to talk. It's a rare day. Uh, good evening, everyone. Jeff Carlson, the Natural Resources Coordinator for the town of Nantucket. Um, I'd just like to clarify a couple points that Ms. Zona brought up. The structure that's in existence, the, the building next to the lighthouse on Brant Point, this construction project will not change the size of that building substantially. There's a little wart on the side that will be added, but the bulk of the building will remain exactly the same. It's a historic structure that was put there in the 1920s, and we've had to vet this project through the State Historic Preservation Office, through the HDC. Uh, they've received permits from all of those offices, um, and the town has been very committed going forward. I mean, just recently we've added a water quality biologist, and we've also have a, you know, our shellfish biologist that's been here for about five years, and I think the town has been very focused on water quality initiatives, uh, eelgrass management, shellfish management, and I think that the commitment of the town has been there and I ask you strongly to, to support this article. Thank you. Mr. DaCosta? To Ms. Zoda's point of whether the town continues to uh, support the Natural Resources Department, as Mr. Carlson said, we added staff this year. Uh, base Galloping is the last, repeat, last commercial fishery that Nantucket has. 
Water quality is probably one of the most important things for me on this board. I know since I've been on the board, we've made numerous initiatives to continue to keep the water quality in the harbors and ponds and to improve it wherever possible. Um, the hatchery under the new facility will be able to grow immense amount more seed than it does now with the same staff. It'll be more functional than it is now. Not just bay scallops, but coal hogs and oysters. Agri aquaculture is the fastest growing part of our shellfish industry in Nantucket. All you gotta do is go up into Wall Winnet and the Pulpus Harbor and look at all the leases. They're finally at the point where they're starting to make some money with these leases. Guys have put a, I can't even tell you how many hours in without any return yet. And they're finally at the point where they can sell some of these shellfish. Um, I think Nantucket has a long, deep history and heritage of commercial fishing, especially bay scalloping. We're one of the last harbors in New England that still has a substantial um, bay scallop fishery. And all you have to do is look at this year's crops and realize that last year we didn't have a fully capacity, a full a hatchery that was operating at full capacity because of the construction. And you'll understand why we want to get this appropriation in place and continue with the work. Because if, if this, this is voted through tonight, the hatchery will be up and running at 100% by spring, ha uh, spring spawning season. Thank you. Okay, this article requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion of the Finance Committee as printed in the warrant. A no vote will defeat that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That is unanimously adopted. Okay. So, Article 2. Article 2 starts on page 3 of the warrant, continues to page 4. The planning board motion is on pa starts on page 5, continues to page 6, and to page 7, and then to page 8. I would ask for your unanimous consent to waive the reading of that motion. Thank you. I want to point out that when we vote, we are not voting on either the planning board comment or the finance committee comment that I read into the record at the beginning of the meeting. Those comments are informational only and are not part of what you're voting. The, the motion itself ends with the sentence, except as expressly provided by section 139.30 of this chapter. I recognize Chairman Barry Rector of the Planning Board for the purpose of making that motion. Is there a second? Motion is made and seconded. Uh, I think I'm going to you, Mr. Wall. I guess I should say one thing before we get started about Article 2. As you know, um, there was the memorandum of agreement that was entered into today by the Richmond Group and the Board of Selectmen available on the town website. If there is an amendment to this article, there is a provision of that agreement that requires, well, that allows the Richmond Group to vitiate that agreement if the um, amendment is deemed by them to be substantive. So if there are amendments to this, you're going to see me stop and ask the Richmond Group to give us a determination if it's a substantive amendment or a non-substantive amendment. Have I explained that properly, Mr. Giorgio? Okay. So, Mr. Wall? Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. Sorry, a little problem here. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone for filling up the stadium tonight to discuss housing. And I just want to declare one thing. This has nothing to do with 106 Surfside Road. If anyone in here thinks that we're discussing or voting on something to do with 106, that is not correct. <clears throat> An incredible amount of time, effort, by so many people have gone into these two articles. 
its staff, town administration staff, the selectmen, the finance committee. Meetings were juggled in all different directions over the last three weeks to get these articles in this meeting to happen tonight. I'd like to thank the Richmond Group for paying for tonight's town meeting. This is very important, everybody. So I am here to speak first to get everyone, hopefully, calm down about housing, if I can do it. I don't know if I can, but I'm going to try. <clears throat> this, these articles are companion articles. This article is actually needed to come before Article 1. Okay. Um, the land in question that we're discussing, everybody knows Wally World, it's going to get developed. One way or the other, that property is going to be developed. So we have to get that in our mind, okay? Thirdly, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of technical questions tonight. There are people in this room a lot smarter than me that can answer those technical questions. Um, right now, I'd like to talk about local control. We all love local control. We just had a local control discussion about the island home. We love our pond opening to be done the way we want. We went through a big deal about 25 years ago about that, remember? We like to deal with our own harbor issues. We like to deal with the steamship, even though we don't always get on the boat we want. You've got our phone numbers. You can't call the state and say, I want to get on the boat, OK? The sewer issue, remember when we had a consent order in 2005 to shut down the sewer plant? Moratorium on hookups. The landfill, 97, in this room, we voted to have what we have today. Right or wrong, that's what we voted for. We do not want a McDonald's solution to housing. We have an opportunity to have a very unique working relationship through the special permit process, along with the MOU from the, from the Board of Selectmen, HDC review, just like everything else, to create enough housing to get us to 7%. That stuff will be touched on by this lady right here, Mr. Arminetti, and some other people that know what they're talking about when it gets down to the gory details. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to explain is that we, uh, we have a chance to do something that we've never had the opportunity to do before. The rubber band of affordable housing has snapped. We just didn't know it was stretching. We only discuss it every so many years when a 40B application comes in. We don't really think about it after it goes away. But this issue has been festering for years, just like the last issue we just discussed at the Ion Home, just like previous issues with the dump and the septic and the sewer plant. So I would like to turn this over to Mr. Arminetti from Richmond. He is a good guy. You guys might like to. Uh, to know him, he uh, speaks very well and has the knowledge that we need to understand the technical details of these articles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Arminetti? Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. That's a lot of pressure now to put on me. And thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dave Arminetti. I'm Director of Real Estate Development for the Richmond Company and Richmond Great Point Development. As many of you who know me know that I manage the day-to-day -day activities of Richmond with our strategy and planning and permitting for our properties on the island uh, in what Mr. Lowell termed as Gloacchiville. Day-to-day, um, -day, I do that in conjunction with my colleague, Patty Ragavine, who virtually all of you know. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. We know a special town meeting is a little dif different. Everyone's coming out tonight showing the interest and the commitment to this critical issue to the community, and we appreciate that. 
it's uh, still a little daunting for someone who's born and bred in New Bedford to be on the Nantucket Town Meeting floor, but uh, it's my third time and I appreciate the privilege. So why are we here? Why did we propose this? We have a housing crisis. I think everyone can admit that. To illustrate that, I want to make a quick point about what, stealing a line from Mr. Lowell, is economics. We discuss not economics, but economics. And I'm going to cite and illustrate some figures quickly that we track. Uh, they're not our figures. They're from Jennifer Shalley at Windwalker Real Estate, who many of you know, who does some great research in this area. Just to illustrate the magnitude of the problem, in the last three years, single-family home sales in the island have been very consistent. And here's the average. Eight out of 10 single-family homes in the last three, ten, three years have sold for more than $750,000. Eight out of 10. Seven out of 10 single-family homes in the last three years have sold for over a million dollars. A million dollars. It's simply not sustainable. So tonight, we have a choice how to start to fix the problem in a meaningful way. And that's why we're here. That's why Patty and I hit the bricks and went out, and a couple hundred of you and our neighbors were willing to sign to get this meeting started tonight and start to debate this and make a real contribution towards the solution. And that's what we want to be, part of the solution. We have the capability, we have the land, we have the financing capability, and we want to be part of the solution for the community, starting tonight. The issue we face is very, very complex and difficult. Housing, affordable housing, how to manage the impacts of development and density. But the decision we're here to make tonight, we believe, is a very simple one, and Mr. Lowell touched on it. Do we want to have local control and local input and embrace that, or do we want to get stuck with a state-mandated process under Chapter 40B and have very little local control and very little local input? We think the answer is simple. And then we want to roll up our sleeves with the community, all the boards and all of our neighbors and abutters who have worked so hard to get started on this process and start to solve it. That's why we're here. And if we make the right decision tonight and going forward, the hidden benefit of all this for the greater good of the community is we can single-handedly be the biggest ally that the town and the community have to create enough affordable housing units to bring the town what's called safe harbor under state law. So the town can actually defeat unsuitable or hostile 40B housing projects entirely or slow them down so they either won't happen or be more difficult to happen. That's a very rare thing. Virtually no other communities of this nature in the Commonwealth reach that status. And we're here to help you and the community do that, starting tonight. Why did we propose this? Um, the editor of the INM, Mrs. Stanton, raised this question in one of her columns a couple weeks ago, which is a very good question. There's a healthy skepticism when a developer proposes something that seems like it's too good to be true. Why did they do it? What are they going to get out of it? Is it too good to be true? Our motives are clear here and also very clean. We get something out of this deal. We get a lot out of this deal. Primarily, we get two things that are very valuable to a real estate developer or a real estate owner. We get certainty of the process. We know what our permits are going to be. We know the boards that we're going to have to go in front of. And we know the community that we're going to have to go in front of and prove ourselves to get these permits. And we get an expedited process. If we do this right and the community embraces this process, we can move more quickly than a 40B process could move. And we get to be part of the solution. But we give up a lot, and that's critical. We give up all the zoning waivers that would be allowed by law under 40B. We give up our exemption from input from all the other local boards that we would get by law under 40B. We give up all the protection of the state under what's called the Housing Appeals Committee, which is where a 40B project goes if the developer and the community can't agree on the outcome of that project. And as your consultant said a couple of weeks ago in a seminar that the town administration and the Board of Selectmen were so good to host, a gentleman by the name of Ed Marchand, nine out of 10 decisions that go to this Housing Appeals Committee are decided in favor of the landowner and the developer, not the town. Again, we want to be part of the solution. We give and we get. That's the nature of a good compromise, whether it's with your spouse or in business or with the government. And that's what we have on the table tonight. Let me talk about affordability for a few minutes. We were here in this venue in April at annual town meeting, and we proposed an all-market rate housing project 
for about half of the land that we're talking about tonight. And we heard you loud and clear, our neighbors in the community. We want defined affordability and we want guaranteed affordability. And don't come back until you can give us that. Well, we're back. And we have a great project to talk about. We have defined affordability and we have guaranteed affordability at a scale that's never been seen before in the town and will probably never be seen again. Let me talk about how affordability can be created. There's only one of two ways you can create affordability in housing, especially in such a high cost area as we face here in Nantucket with the high cost of land, the high cost of labor, the high cost of materials. You can either do it through a subsidy, getting money from the government or another source, or getting free land or getting CPC funds. We're not asking for any of that. We're not getting any of that. Or you can do it through an increased density. That's what we're proposing tonight. A little bit of increased density for a heck of a lot of affordable housing to protect this community and to sustain us into the future with real affordability, real housing, targeted to the year-round middle class of this community. Not the million dollar homeowners, not the two million dollar homeowners. We're providing real affordability in terms of numbers. If this is approved over the next few years and we develop the 325 total units of housing, we're gonna add 244 units of affordable housing to the town's inventory, which Mr. Vorst and Ms. Barrett, the town's housing consultant, can speak to more. But the bottom line is every town in the state has to get greater affordable housing numerically or they're subject to uh, exposure to these 40B projects and other hostile development projects. We're the biggest single solution that contribute to that in the town. Overnight, we can increase the town's percentage of affordable housing from 2.47% to 7%. We're targeting this housing primarily to year-round residents by giving them priority in the selection process. We're giving 100% priority to certain of our affordable housings, which would not be allowed under state law. And let me talk about the economics again for a minute. One of the products we're offering is a housing price that would be consistent with what the Mass Housing 40B guidelines are, but in a friendly way. We're going to offer 19 affordable single-family home ownership units, all in, brand new, turnkey, move in at $300,000. It's a brand new three bedroom house on a 5,000 square foot lot in our neighborhood. Secondly, we're going to offer seven locally affordable single family housing units that we couldn't offer under the 40B process because it's disallowed by law. And the Board of Selectmen, to their credit, really embraced this concept. Again, we're trying to target year round islanders who missed the cycle perhaps in the Sachem's Path project that we all know about that's been done over the last couple of years. Because of the high cost and the high income here, the normal state income standards don't uh, apply. So this would be proposed where people making up to what's called 175% of the area median income could still qualify for our affordable houses under this program that we're proposing tonight in a collaborative way with the town. You could make up to $164,500 per year in gross income and still buy an affordable house in our development that's less than $600,000. I believe the Covenant House price this year is $675,000. So with our program, if you vote for this tonight, people will be able to make $25,000 more than the income limit in the Covenant program and buy a house for $85,000 less. Brand new in our development. Real affordability. We know there's a crisis. One of the things we've found is that there seems to be a misperception about Who's subject to the crisis? Is it just seasonal workers or service employees? Hotel, restaurants and bars, landscapers, contractors, airport? It's not. Those people are affected, but the rest of the community is affected. People in every walk of life, every industry. Town employees. Ask Mrs. Gibson how much trouble they have retaining and attracting good employees for the town because of the housing issue. Fire and police. Nurses and lab techs and school teachers. And I'll relay a little story that, that really drove home to me because my father was a public school teacher for 30 some years. About six months ago, about a month after we were here for town meeting last, ran into a school teacher, started to talk a little bit, understood they had come here about seven years ago, masters in teaching, just like virtually all the teachers in the school system, loves Nantucket, 
been here six or seven years, the kind of teacher that takes money out of their own pocket to fund field trips and arts and crafts for our students. That kind of person that the community wants to attract and retain. The only thing they could find and afford in the last six or seven years was a tiny one-bedroom apartment with no kitchen and a hot plate to cook on for $1,800 a month. A glorified dorm room for a teacher that's teaching the youth of this community. That's who's affected by this housing crisis. So when you make your decision and you deliberate tonight, don't approve this for me. Don't approve this for Patty. Don't approve this for Phil. Don't approve this for the Richmond Company. Approve it for the school teacher who deserves more and approve it for the long-term sustainability of the island. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Thank you. So, I know. I know. Okay. All right, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Uh, nobody knows more about the housing nightmares on this island than I do. Uh, and that was a very polished presentation, and I thank you for that. Uh, my own, I have two questions. First of all, how can you guarantee that this housing will be provided for year-round individuals? How can you not allow corporate entities from buying these structures and utilizing them for dormitories. Thanks again, Liz. Uh, Madam Moderator, through you. There are a couple of different vehicles, Mr. Ray, that we can use. First of all, one of the main bodies of the memorandum of, under, of agreement that we signed a few hours ago with the Board of Selectmen that we've been working on for several weeks has provisions in that that are contractually binding to us in terms of the affordability and the targeting of that. And one of the things that a couple of the selectmen were instrumental in, in conjunction with us being on the same page, was we're going to restrict the rental housing to leases of no less than a one-year term in our pr entire property. And we're going to restrict leasing of any of the single-family homes to greater than 30-day uh, period. So no short-term rentals, no short-term employee rentals. In terms of the sales, we're proposing a maximum of 100 single-family ownership units. We have to be a little careful because there are very clear fair housing laws and discrimination laws that we can't violate. But we can target our marketing, and by the type of product we're doing, we're going to limit the number of parking spaces, we're going to limit the number of bedrooms, and we're going to privately limit, which has been confirmed in law, and Ms. Barrett the town's housing consultant can confirm this. Mr. Giorgio, town council, can confirm this. There is case law and there is precedent that you can limit the number of unrelated people in a dwelling unit by covenant to prevent that problem. So that's the primary vehicle we're going to use. And it's enforceable by an ironclad contract that five of your Board of Selectmen members signed a couple of hours ago and that Mr. Paston signed. Black and white. Thank you, Mr. Howarth. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Howarth, My Comment Avenue. I wanted to just provide, from my own personal experience as a 62-year-old guy living here, and having seen back what happened in the previous generation, and I've been around here now off and on since 1991, so I've been watching this for a while. I was talking to my dad today. My dad's 85. When he came out of Korea in 1954, he bought a house for 12 grand. He was 24 years old. He had us kids. By 1956, he had three kids in that same house. He managed to be able to move forward. He did well, or I wouldn't be here, and thank goodness for that. Um, Jen Shally's numbers are, are always phenomenal. I'll give you one from my own perspective, though, as a real estate agent on this island. There's a guy that I was privileged to be the buyer's agent for on a property last year. One of the hardest working kids. He's in the entertainment business, he's in the hospitality business, but he's year round. Saved, worked, saved. 29 year old guy. The only one that I know of, by the way, and all the experience that I've been here in his 20s that actually pulled this off. 
and he bought the only single family home that was available on Nantucket in that period of time, over that four or five months, for $570,000. 12 grand to $570,000. He's almost 30, he's got no kids, he's got a wife to be. I was privileged to have the opportunity to be able to do it, but we could not find him anything else. This is a good project. This is what we need. We can't be having a circumstance like that come up over and over and over and over again where it's that limited. These kids are living 15 people to a house, six people to a house, Richard's spoken to this. We can't have that. It's not fair for these guys to, and girls to be coming up to 30 years old and not have a piece of it their own. This is the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Benz? I'd just be curious in the memorandum of understanding that was signed how the um, limitation on uh, unrelated individuals living in one of these places will be enforced. We've had that on the town books forever, and it has not been enforced. Be nice if it were. Okay. Hi, Patty Ragavine. I'm with the Richmond Company. As you know, I'm also a neighbor here on Nantucket. Um, we have a couple of mechanisms. Um, we are very much interested in keeping this development a really nice development, a wonderful development. Um, we have um, um, uh, basically started working with the neighbors surrounding our development, um, looking at what might be something we provide them as well as in terms of security just along these lines. The homeowners association that we intend to create will have uh, restrictions on this kind of use. The management company, Richmond Company, will retain management over the property, so it's not like we're building these and leaving. Um, this will be a long-term effort that we continue to monitor and to watch. You can't tell us anything new uh, given what we've actually inherited there in the properties with respect to homes and rentals. What I've seen personally in the last two years is horrific, frankly, and there is no control. We are working closely with the new health director. I know that um, a lot of the problem on the island is it's hard to turn people out when there's nowhere to go. And so we're all stuck between a rock and a hard place. Well, we know what the rules are, but what are we going to do about it? The only way we can solve that problem is to have more product because with more product, no one is gonna spend $1,000 a month, and I've heard of this, to live on a couch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman in the front row of the back section in the white shirt. Hold on. Ms. Gammon, I like the project, but I don't like this idea that you're covering all the expenses here. Is this going to be a trend in the future? The expenses of town meeting? Yeah. For, for it kind of entices people along the, the path that they want to be voted. Thank you. Okay. All right, the woman here in the pink shirt, go ahead and stand up. We'll get you a microphone. I think it's Kate. Hi. Hi, Kate Raphael. My question is this, is that I feel like we very often um, have short memories. And I, up until just last week, owned a rental. And it wasn't long ago there was a major recession in this country and it affected this island. And quite frankly, it was, hard, it was hard pressed to find anybody who could even afford a rental of any price. And in fact, lowered the price $700 a month just to find someone to fill that. So I guess what I'm wondering is, are we reacting to um, 
coming out of the recession? Are we overreacting to it? Is this something we have to have? I, I just, I guess I'm concerned about what happens when the next recession comes along and all of these people have to leave because there's no work. Mr. Arminetti? If you, if you hand me the knitting needles, Liz, I'm not gonna know what to do. <laughs> I'll be in trouble. Thank you, it's a good question, ma'am, and it's one that we've thought of quite a bit. Um, we're in a very strong economic time now, we're in a crisis, but that could change. Uh, the good news about that is twofold. There's so much pent up demand right now, particularly on the rental side and in the pricing segments that we're talking about, that we will probably sell these houses and rent these apartments three times over. An example is, many of you know, we got an approval for a smaller all market apartment project in the last few months from the planning board and the historic district commission at the corner of Brigland Avenue and Nancy Ann Lane in our property. An acre and two thirds, 28 units in six two story buildings. In two weeks time with zero advertising, either in the paper or any other source, just word of mouth on Nantucket, which is the greatest thing ever. More than 150 people came down to our office, pounding on the door all hours of the day and night, looking for Patty, chasing her down the street to apply for these apartments. Our answer, unfortunately, was we only have 28. We got 150 applications in two weeks with no advertising. And the good news, one of the things the community is concerned about I know, so we'll answer this question in advance. It's good in this context. Are we going to draw a lot of people over from the mainland because you provide this housing, especially such attractive, affordable housing for Nantucket? The answer is no. In a way, that problem takes care of itself. Of the 150 applications we got for these 28 apartment units, 149 were for permanent islanders with employment on the island. One was from off-island. And as Patty said at a hearing a couple weeks ago, it was a woman who used to work at Nantucket Hotel, couldn't keep her job because she couldn't find housing and wants to come back. Local housing, local solution. The other answer is we have a large, very financially capable company who's in this for the long haul. From the day we came here and Mr. Paston stated our intentions, we're here for the long haul to do what's right for Nantucket. This is not a one or a two year project. As Patty said, we're not gonna sell and run. We're going to be here for 10 or 15 years. We're going to build this out in phases. If things slow down a little bit, we'll put the brakes on a little and we'll only develop as many houses as we can. But we have a huge amount of land, 65 acres total. This proposal relates to about 30 acres. And we have the ability to calibrate that flow and that demand in the market, unlike any other landowner. We don't have to sell and rent immediately to still make a return that's reasonable. We can be patient and we can stick around, and we intend to. Mr. Fredericks? Dave Fredericks. Um, Ms. Um, Madam Moderator, I had two questions, if I could, through you, if possible. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the timeline. Certainly one of the concerns that um, I have is how quickly this might happen, but it really relates then to a second set of questions that I would like to ask the planning staff. I, as I understand what would happen here, this, this vote allows certain zoning changes, but then there is all of the subdivision regulation that the proponent has to go through. And the one that comforts me the most about the plan is it has to require then a special permit. And I wanted to confirm through the planning staff that a special permit is something that can be open from time to time if we feel that it's not meeting all of the needs or expectations that we talked about tonight. Okay. Mr. Vorce? <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew Vorce. So the question about the special permit, um, what is Im what is important and what is great about um, Article 2 is it, it does require a special permit that is issued by the planning board. It's a super majority of four to five vote. In addition, there is also subdivision, uh, uh, subdivision control, the subdivision control law, which is the subdivision of the actual property. And um, the permit would be subject to major site plan review, which has a whole list of um, standards um, regarding traffic and drainage and all kinds of things. 
Uh, that was strengthened by the uh, agreement signed by the Board of Selectmen, and I'm, I'm actually very happy at that process and the work that they did. Um, so, and furthermore, uh, the special permit, if we do find violations, we can, at our own um, initiative, call the special permit, and it gives us additional strength to um, enforce it. Thanks. Thank you. Did that answer your questions, Mr. Fredericks? Okay. Mr. Armanetti, do you want to answer that? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, it is a good question from two perspectives. Again, we can calibrate the phasing based on the market and the demand, and we have the financial capability to do that. We'd like to move very quickly in the initial phase. That's part of the magic of this solution, as opposed to going through the 40B process, which would probably take at least a bit longer. If we move quickly and we make a decision tonight, we could probably get this approved and get the units on the town's inventory in six to eight months and get in the ground next fall. I mean, I'm sorry, later this fall, if we move that quickly. The first phase, because of the amount of demand, will probably be larger than the re recurring phases in the future. We'd like to do probably about two-thirds of the houses in the first phase, so there'll be plenty of inventory to take all this pent-up demand. We're also going to sell some lots on the single-family side and build some houses, so we'll have a diversity of product. And Mr. Fredericks, as you know, that's important in terms of trying to absorb a project into the market. So we'll have both types of product, not just built houses and not just lots, but both. And then secondly, the phasing is very important, and it's probably more appropriate for Mr. Vorce or Ms. Barrett to talk about this, but it's very important in terms of this safe harbor protection with the town, that we can protect the town from inappropriate development by phasing the product and the project properly. And part of the memorandum of understanding with the Board of Selectmen, as we previously referenced, has those provisions in it. Again, the phrase I've been using in the last couple of weeks is, politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, affordable housing makes strange bedfellows. Here, a developer can be the best ally of the town in improving your standing with affordable housing and protecting you under this safe harbor provision. And that's part of the phasing that we're going to work on cooperatively with the community and with the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, up there in the back, Mr. Fransudo, I think you have someone. Hi, um, I'm Jenny Paradise. I live on Pinecrest Drive, which is off of Old South Road, not too far from where all this is going to happen. And I am for the project, I'm for these uh, articles. Um, that land back there has been ill used for many years, and I think this is the best use for it. I also think um, collaborating with the town to plan this properly and do it right instead of having it rammed down our throat by somebody else who doesn't care about us is, it's just the right way to go. So that's my, those are my two cents. Thank you. Ms. Kuspa? It's Ann Kuspa, Housing Nantucket Executive Director. Um, I'd like to speak in favor of these articles, one and two. Housing Nantucket, for those of you who don't know, we're a local nonprofit dedicated to creating affordable housing solutions for the island. And uh, this spring, we conducted a housing needs assessment. Judy Barrett and the uh, planning office also helped to assist with that. Um, one of the recommendations of the report was, well, first of all, there is a extreme housing need here, for those of you who don't know, and it's across all price levels. Um, and one of the suggestions and recommendations was that we, as a community, work with a 40B developer to create this type of housing. Um, housing Nantucket supports this for a couple of different reasons, one of which is that 75 units of affordable housing are created through this zoning change. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was that Housing Nantucket also directly benefits from this zoning change 
through a land swap that we did with the Richmond company. So um, there's a lot of different benefits for affordable housing and I support this as well as the rest of my board and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the gentleman up sort of in the mid, yeah, right there, if you could stand up. Hello, uh, my name's Rich Ross. I live on Newtown Road. I just had a quick question. Is it possible for some of us who didn't get a chance to see the special deal that was made between the Board of Selectmen and the Passing Group to actually see what that deal incurred tonight before you know voting on an article that has that as a stipulation? Is that possible? Uh, good question. Let me see if I can be more persuasive. All right, we'll, we'll work on that for a minute. Um, yeah, way up in the back. Uh, Nick, Nick Miller, I have just a, a technical question. Uh, the word uh, area median income, can we please define that as Nantucket County? Where, where are you, Mr. Miller, in the, um, in the recommendation so I can Look near the bottom of page four and also a few times on page five. Paragraph 4C. 4C. Annual area median income. I simply would like to make sure the area is Nantucket County and not some larger area. I'm not finding that. Fourth line, what page? Page four. On page four, but page four is just the art is the Paragraph four, subparagraph C, fourth line down, area median income. Okay, but that is the article. That I need to see where that occurs in the motion. The motion starts on page five. On page five, you'll see the same word, area median income, uh, in, paragraphs, in paragraph one about workforce Home ownership, housing. Okay, let me find it and, in there then. And rental housing. Okay, below 175% of area median income and then below that under workforce rental housing, 80% of area median income. And you wanna say Nantucket County, Nantucket County area median income? Mr. Um, Armagnetti, is that an amendment that is substantive? For, well, wait Thank a minute. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Wait that. a minute. First of all, let me just, let me say this. Mr. Miller's suggestion is that we add Nantucket County in one, in the definition of workforce owner, home ownership housing and workforce rental housing to define area median income so that it's Nantucket County area median income. Is that your amendment, Mr. Miller? Okay, is there a second? Okay, motion is made and seconded. Now I'm gonna go to Mr. Armagnetti and then I'm gonna go help these people find it. Okay. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I think we get the sentiment, sir. Unfortunately, from a technical standpoint, this is a, a financial figure that is established every year by the federal government, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. They come out every year, generally in the third quarter of every year, I think it is, Ms. Barrett, October, November, if we're lucky, with an annual update to the median income for every county and every metropolitan area in the country. Um, it is a number that's specific to Nantucket, but technically, and Ms. Barrett can answer this even better than I, it does change from time to time the exact geographic area. Um, so I wouldn't limit it to that from a technical standpoint, but there might be some language that can get to the sentiment of what you're talking about and result in the same result for the community. For 
are you, Madam Moderator? Um, Judy Barrett, RKG Associates. I think I might be able to help with this. Um, the income limits are set by the Department of Housing and Urban Development based on geographic areas that are actually defined by the Federal Office of Management and Budget, and those geographies change about every 10 years. So the risk you have in trying to be too specific in your zoning is that if the geography somehow changes, the only way you can sort of fix the problem later is to come back and amend the zoning. I think the real answer is that um, elsewhere in this article, the affordable units are required to be approved for the subsidized housing inventory um, in accordance with the rules and requirements of the state local initiative program. And that program ties you back to what the appropriate income limits are. So as long as Nantucket County is the geography, the local initiative program will basically provide that cover for you. So I don't think you need to be any more specific um, in the article. Okay. So on the proposed amendment only, do you wish to pursue that, Mr. Miller, or are you willing to withdraw that? No, I think that's a good answer. Okay. All right. So I'm going to withdraw that amendment and just go back to the language of the motion as it was printed in the warrant. So on that motion, I'm sure there are other hands. Is there a section I've ignored? Oh, let's go over here. Yes, please stand up and when you get the microphone, state your name. Um, Natalie Seminero, formerly of Essex Road, and I now live on My Comet Avenue. I, I, I'm hoping I'm doing this right because I'm going back to the open discussion that we had. Yes. So I think that everyone in the room can agree <clears throat> that we have a situation. It's a problem, it's a crisis. And as a result of the crisis, there have been multiple backlashes and uh, further issues that have happened on the island and that in many ways affect all of us. So I love the idea of this proposal. I want to trust our elected officials. I want to trust that we all have the betterment of our community at heart. What I am most, I shouldn't say most interested, where I am still very interested in is what Patty had mentioned before in, in, in response to a question and a concern over, I, I don't want to call it policing, but the how we can protect from the numbers of people that could be living in a certain unit. Um, speaking in terms of landlord tenants, landlords have no rights. So, you know, if we have homeowners in there that are renting, even if they don't know that there are 10 people living in their home, I can tell you there's nothing they can do about it. So I love this idea. I want this to be a very realistic possibility for Nantucket, for friends of mine who are looking for homes, for teachers who are looking for homes, and landscapers across all diversities, across all economic um, standards. But again, I'm going to come to, will it be made transparent to us if we're going to take the chance and not only welcome but embrace this situation and this opportunity for Nantucket Will these proposed um, policings be made transparent to the community members here in some way that you can assure us that what has happened to some of us and some people we have known, well, how, will that, how is that realistically going to be policed without me getting any further. I'm looking at Richard Ray looking at me. He knows what I'm talking about. How is this going to be monitored? That's my question. So that it's used for the right purpose and not abused by a very growing population as a result of obviously problems. It happens because there are problems. So I just want to know if that's going to be made transparent to us, all of the ways that these proposed solutions are going to be actually implemented. Okay. Thank you. Sure, thank you. No? Oh, there it is. You know, the, the, one of the things I think we want to keep reiterating today and reminding folks of, when we look at this development, one of the, 
most important core components of it is that it's going to have to go through a special permit process. That process will include a lot of regulations on what we can and can't do. That's why we're all feeling more comfortable about this local control, because that's the process that will help us get that confidence that Natalie's looking for. I know Judy has an answer, part, part answer to this too, Ms. Barrett, but I want to start out by saying just that. If we go to the state and go through that, there are no guarantees that this kind of um, abuse, frankly, will go on. And all of us know it, and all of us know people that have been part of it. And I go back to, again, my other answer, which is that when there's no, pro when there's no place to go, all right, people will put up with this Who's going to pay for that kind of living arrangement if there's some place brand new, um, safe, and, and reliable to go and to live through? So on a purely economic basis, I think we've got it licked. On, on the fact that the local control, the planning board and its regulations are going to be on top of that and far as regulate, you know, as far as controlling our homeowners, the establishment of a homeowners association, the requirements of a homeowners association, and many of you are part of homeowners associations, you know they don't sleep. We know better than anybody else who's got what going on, right? It's not a, it's not a big secret when you live next door. That's what we're going to be using. It's going to be self-policed because our neighborhood is going to want a certain character. And I think that that's really where we're going with this. Will we continue to work with the town? I hope so. I think once we can free up some products, some availability, then the town is in a better spot, frankly, to go after some of the more abusive situations. And now I'm going to hand this is through you, Ms. Moderator, to Judy Barrett. Okay. Ms. Barrett? Certainly through you, Madam Moderator. Um, in addition to everything that was just stated, I guess I'd like to point out that it is a requirement of the affordable housing deed restriction that the homeownership units be monitored on an annual basis um, to determine that the buyer who benefited from the unit is occupying that house as their principal residence. So there's both the special permit protection that you get um, under the zoning that's being proposed here, but the deed restriction itself requires that annual monitoring for the affordable units. Um, and it is certainly in the islands um, interest to make sure that that monitoring is done because you wouldn't want to lose those units from the subsidized housing inventory and certainly that is one of the consequences if you don't monitor the units properly. So there is actually a requirement in the deed rider um, that requires those units to be uh, occupied as the principal residence. Thank you. Yes? Go ahead. Molly Glazer, Skyline Drive. Um, I want if someone could speak about the process of the traffic and the decision where the roads are going to be out of this project. Mr. Vorce or Mr. Armagnetti, which I don't, either one. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the, there's two ways that the uh, traffic and roadway network will be reviewed. The planning board uh, will examine uh, subdivision um, if new roads, uh, for, well, for the portion of new roads that are being proposed and will have input into uh, how they are laid out, what their surface is, um, and what their route is. Uh, in addition, the um, major site plan review requires a traffic study, so Richmond will be required to fund a traffic study. Richmond will also uh, be required to fund a peer review, so a peer, uh, basically a traffic engineer hired by the planning board and reporting to the planning board will review their uh, traffic report and point out any inconsistencies and make sure that all the information is correct. All of that will be reviewed during our um, a public hearing process, so there's an opportunity for people to review those plans, to ask questions, uh, and to make their positions known to the board. Okay, Mr. Mil Miller? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I actually have, have two questions. Would you like them one at a time, or should I ask them together? Just ask them together. Okay. The, uh, the first question is, 
I wonder if we could uh, ask Mr. Armanetti for a little bit of help with the arithmetic. Uh, it's not clear to me that you know we have in excess of 11,000 uh, housing units on the island. It's not clear to me how the number of units that are affordable units are going to be added are going to get us from 2.4 percent to 7 percent. Uh, without getting te too technical about it, it just doesn't seem to compute. And then secondly, I just wanted to go a little further on the question of traffic. I mean, uh, I know we can do studies and, and that's all that's going to be required, but I, I would like to get a, a stronger sense that there's going to be a lot of consideration paid to the fact that Old South Road is, is almost impassable now. And, and um, if you were to suddenly add two or 300 new housing units out there, I mean, it's what, what would result is almost unimaginable. So I'm wondering what, uh, you know, how, how the issue of phasing is going to be addressed. Um, will, will the, hopefully some of the road improvements be made f before we start or in conjunction with the development so that there might be a, a turning lane or improvements to uh, the existing rotary or, you know, maybe we will add the rotary at Fairgrounds Road or some, some of the many improvements that have been discussed. Are they actually going to start to happen in conjunction with this so that we don't find ourselves sitting in traffic out there and saying, oh my God, wh whoever let this happen while we're sitting in our car for two hours waiting to get to the airport. Um, so a little bit more information along those lines would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Barrett? Thank you. For you, Madam Moderator, the um, percentage of affordable units is based on a denominator that's comprised of your year-round housing, not your total housing. So the units that are counted by the Census Bureau as seasonal do not factor into the denominator. Okay. And then traffic, Mr. Vorce? Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. So traffic, um, first of all, I guess our first step is we need to get, we need to see if this passes number one, and then a traffic report will be issued. What is great about the phasing is that we will see a total mitigation plan, and I think you all know that we have different plans that have been on the books that are working their way through the capital budget process now. Um, with this project, we may need to advance those. We may need to get contributions from Richmond, and all of that really uh, comes out through the process. I think it's, it, it's very important to have the phasing because what Mr. Miller said is correct. We'll be able to plan out, uh, it, especially if we reach a safe harbor provision, we'll have a little bit of time to get uh, all of our plans and uh, have these uh, various studies done um, and not be under the gun for a 40B um, timeline, which is, which is quite um, rushed. So uh, the phasing works for us. It gives us an opportunity. I think we will see what you suggested. We probably will see increments. We'll see maybe turning lanes. We might see, I, d I don't know exactly what the final um, mitigation package will look like. It really has to come out of that traffic study. Um, once we have that information, we'll be able to better assess that. Thank you. Mr. DeCosta? I, I just wanted to make a couple of points. The first was um, to, to the lady's issue over here about, um, about forcing the, the uh, over the subletting of the units. Um, this is the MOA, and I'm, I'm going to read from a paragraph from it. Um, Rental units shall have be set forth in a permanent deed restriction prohibiting subletting of rental units shall be set forth in a permanent deed restriction and enforceable by the town. This MOA is, is in essence a contract. It's binding between the town and, and the Richmond group. We don't have that in any of the other rental homes on the island. We can't, you know, that's up to the, to the owner of the home to to enforce how many people are living there. We, this gives us a lot more clout with that. The other thing I want to emphasize is we're going to get these houses out here, whether it's through this initiative, which gives us control, or a 40B. In other words, if this was defeated tonight, the Richmond group still has a 40B application pending in front of the state. And they're going to continue with that if this doesn't pass. So one way or another, there's going to be those houses on that land. 
I, for one, would much rather have local control, including the HTC, the planning board, and all the neighborhood input, than to just let someone at the state house decide what's going to be built and how it's going to be built. The gentleman up in the first row of the back section. Hello, Madam Moderator. My name is Scott Allen. I live on Daffodil Lane. Um, I'm sure everybody at the very front of the room recognizes me from uh, the multiple meetings that we've sat in on and requests that we've made to them. Um, my house at 25 Daffodil Lane is part of a subdivision, uh, Cedar Crest 3 and Cedar Crest 1, that was started by Mr. Glowacki himself. Um, it is not the pit. It is a Noshop style subdivision that is U-shaped, uh, that has one large entrance on Evergreen and a secondary entrance on Miller Lane and then cuts over to Daffodil. At the meetings that I've gone to, I've requested to have additions to either the MOU or through the planning board to not have roads cut through this new subdivision into our current private subdivision. Um, unfortunately, up to this point, the planning board's not been willing to help us with that. The Board of Selectmen, understandably, weren't willing to really touch that because it's a planning board issue. Um, but I'd actually like to add a motion with an addendum um, that I've provided. Um, I can read it, or you can show we're, it. We're getting, it's we're short. getting there. Um, in essence, it's requesting that there be no connections from this new subdivision into our private subdivision. So in the maps that you've seen either online or in the newspaper, we continue to draw these roads coming from cul-de-sacs that are cul-de-sacs in my neighborhood and turning them into a road into this new neighborhood. Um, there was one initially on Daffodil, there was one initially on Mayflower, and there's one initially on Evergreen. Um, plans change, subdivisions change, um, but we're already asking for denser, more dense housing in these areas, and that's what this article is about. These, this isn't the pit that we're rezoning. This is a neighborhood that exists right now. I want to get your amendment up in front of everyone. So, so do just I. let me interrupt for a second. On the top of page seven, uh, let's see. You see right at the very top, you have the end of subparagraph B, then subparagraph C, and subparagraph D. We're adding a new subparagraph E. This is being added to workforce home ownership housing bonus lots which is access to from any of these workforce housing bonus lots shall either be off a public roadway or a new subdivision roadway unconnected to a private approval required subdivision roadway. And then in th three, workforce rental community, basically right at the bottom of page seven, we're adding similar language a new subparagraph E, access to slash from any of these workforce rental community lots shall either be off a public roadway or a new subdivision roadway unconnected to a private approval required subdivision roadway. Is that your amendment, Mr. It, it is, and if I could just add one thing. In the last couple of weeks in our discussions with Richmond directly, uh, Mr. Armanetti, Patty, um, they have suggested that they have no interest in roads that cut through into our private neighborhood, um, that it's specific boards that are requesting that. Um, again, I, I, I'd just like people to consider this. If you've bought a house and you have an HOA that you believe protects you, that your, your house is going to be built a certain way and your roads are going to be used a certain way by a certain number of people, um, that that shouldn't be changed and you're supposed to be protected by that. Richmond's offering that protection. I'm asking you all to vote that protection in for us as well as a neighborhood. Okay, so is there a second for that? Okay, that motion is made and seconded. Now I have to ask the Richmond group, is this considered a substantive amendment? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, it is certainly a substantive amendment under the Warren article and would uh, invoke the provision in the MOA that we signed with the Board of Selectmen to, as you termed it, uh, vitiate the agreement. Um, we certainly appreciate um, 
the genesis, Mr. Allen's thoughts. Um, we think a better way to deal with this is to go down the process through the special permit process with the planning board, with the other boards, and work this out. We've indicated, as Mr. Allen expressed, and it is in writing, to the Cedar Crest Homeowners Association that we will do everything we can to work with them to plan this properly, to minimize the possibility that any roads would cut through their neighborhood. And if we couldn't uh, prevent any cut through at all, we would use design capabilities such as making the configuration more circuitous and difficult to get through either by routing or the path or materials or using speed bumps and speed tables to prevent it from being what I think the neighborhood is really getting at, and which we understand. If we don't do this right, there's a risk that roads cutting through that neighborhood be, could, could become a shortcut to and from the airport and a circumvention to Nobody Road, uh, Nobody Farm Road. We absolutely don't want that. That will harm us as much as it would harm the Cedar Crest neighborhood. So we're definitely aligned in that respect. We just don't want to constrain the zoning article from mandating that not to happen. And in an odd way, once we get working with the neighborhood, they may come to the conclusion that some small, circuitous, minor cut through from the neighborhood could actually benefit them because it could allow them to get to and from Old South Road and to and from the services of our development more readily. So we'd like a chance to plan that out with the neighborhood. We've made a written commitment to the neighborhood. We're going to stand by that written commitment. But allow us to make that process work out through the planning board and don't stop it here in the context of a zoning article. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to um, town council, Mr. Giorgio, just for a couple of points. If you could explain, Mr. Giorgio, first of all, what effect this has under the MOU and then yes. the other issue. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I, I wanted to make two points um, with respect to this amendment. Uh, first of all, uh, in my opinion, this amendment um, is not a proper subject of zoning. Um, I think it would, um, it attempts to uh, regulate through zoning the rights of um, abutters to uh, both public and private ways. And in that regard, uh, I think it's inconsistent with the subdivision control law. Uh, as the previous speaker indicated, these kinds of issues are, are appropriate to be um, dealt with under the subdivision control law and subdivision approval which, uh, as we know, the planning board will be uh, going through that process for, the, for this particular project. So my concern would be that if this amendment were passed, um, it, it would certainly create um, a real possibility of a legal challenge to the zoning amendment, um, because I don't, do not think, uh, or at least it, it raises a question as to whether it's a proper subject of zoning. Uh, secondly, with respect to the effect that this amendment would have on the MOA, um, we were very careful in that MOA to provide a mechanism uh, to anticipate what would happen if um, um, amendments were made on town meeting floor. Uh, this is one example, uh, but there are, of course, many others that could potentially be made that would, in effect, be substantive, uh, and it would, in whole or in part, delete the whole purpose of this uh, zoning amendment um, and the, the potential impact it would have on, on the Richmond group to proceed with a project that they, at this point, have said is economically feasible. So we heard from Richmond Development that they consider this to be a substantive amendment. So if this amendment passes, and then the, un, the zoning bylaw as amendment were to pass, Richmond would not be obligated to fulfill any of the requirements of the MOA and yet the town would have amended its zoning bylaw. Uh, so I think that's something you need to um, think about carefully. Um, this is a substantive amendment and the Richmond group would have the right under the agreement to vitiate the agreement that was signed at five o'clock tonight. Okay, so on the amendment, Dr. Butterworth. Well, we have the MOA. It's just, it's 15 pages long, so. Um, yes, go ahead.
Here's page one, part of it. <laughs> oh, it is up. Okay. Those are the whereas clauses. Those are kind of not important. Okay, stop. So, I mean, I have no idea. There's really no meaningful way for me to share this agreement with you short of reading it out loud to you, which I'm more than happy to do, but I don't think you want me to. Um, may I? Yes, uh, please. Madam Moderator, so uh, we've been at this for quite some time now, negotiating this memorandum of agreement. And let me tell you that um, it was a very hard negotiation. There was a lot of give and take. There were points when I thought, gee, this is not going to happen. And yet, um, both the selectmen and the representatives from the Richmond group uh, over the course of the last week got together several times to hammer out the details of the MOA. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that all of the discussion, and in particular the representations made by the Richmond group, by the um, uh, Director of Land Use Planning, by the town's housing consultant, by the selectmen, are all in accordance with the specific provisions of the, of the MOA. Um, in essence, the MOA is intended to provide a mechanism whereby this project, the Richmond Group, can proceed with the development of the, pro the project exactly as it's been described to you with um, a planning board special permit process rather than requiring a 40B process. As, and as you've heard several times to, tonight, the problem with the, the 40B is that you essentially um, run the risk of losing local control over the project. This MOA provides for local control, not only by the planning board through the permitting process, but also, as uh, Selectman DaCosta said, this is an enforceable document which the town, through the Board of Selectmen, can enforce, if it has to, independent of what the planning board may decide uh, to do with respect to the various permits. Okay. There are a lot of other provisions in this agreement that are very technical in nature, but they're all designed to ensure that the, intent, the intended result occurs. That is, the, the, the uh, units that are constructed pursuant to the MOA and the special permit will in fact uh, count towards the uh, SHI, the Subsidized Housing Inventory, and will uh, increase the town's percentage of units on that SHI, um, not to 10%, but certainly a lot better than where it is today. So we've looked at this, it, we negotiated it, um, and, uh, and we think the MOA carries out certainly the representations that have been made here tonight. Thank you. On the amendment, yeah, in the back row of the first section, if you could stand up and just get a microphone. On the amendment. Whoop. Go ahead. Okay, no, I know, but I was trying to recognize this woman here in the gray sweatshirt. I think she's on the amendment. Yes, on the amendment, my name is Mary Longacre. Um, if I understand what the town council said correctly, our choice with any amendment that Richmond Group deems substantive is that um, if we include an amendment, we could quite likely end up um, worse than we are right now by passing this article potentially, but not having any agreement from the Richmond Group as to how they're going to be controlled. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So on the amendment, let me see. Mr. Director? Barry Rector, Chairman of the Planning Board. I'm going to ask you something very simple tonight, and that is to defeat this amendment. And then I'm going to ask you something very simple again. Do you want local control? Do you want the state to control this? That's what is before you tonight. Make no mistake about it. You've heard from Mr. Armanetti and you've heard from town council and I would also argue as well too 
this borderlines on contractual zoning and actually puts town meeting as, as the authority and approving body of something that would properly before subdivision control law. And I think you're going to find that would create multiple problems with this. Um, and here's the thing, too. One of the reasons why I like local control is I know with the planning board, it is a special permit. You're going to have to get four of the five of us to agree to everything happens. You will be heard. There is adequate time, and believe me, as the chairman of the planning board, I take very seriously the fact I want to hear from anyone who's there. So show up, please, because we do want to hear from you. And here's the real beauty at this point. When this is done, when this is finished, it really never is finished. Because as a planning board with a special permit, if citizens come before us or we believe that we've erred, guess what? We can reopen the public hearing and start the process and look at what went wrong. So I think there's a number of safeguards that sit before you at this tonight. And let me tell you something, I'm, I'm pleased that the developer has gone forward to do this. This is rare in the process, but they realize that putting it in the hands of, of, of a local control can also merit benefit as well. So again, I'm gonna ask you, please defeat this amendment Please go with the recommendations of the planning board tonight. Let's take control of the situation for us in this town and be sincere about what we want to do for affordable housing and those people who are around us who desperately need it. Thank you. Thank you. On the amendment, Mr. Clinton? You want to, well, let's just vote on the amendment. Why don't we do that? Okay. So. The amendment requires a majority vote. A yes vote will adopt the amendment. A no vote will defeat the amendment. The amendment is to add these two paragraphs, one under workforce homeownership housing bonus lots and the other under workforce um, community rental, rental community. It requires a majority vote. All those in favor? Please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The amendment does not carry. So now we're back on the main motion as printed in the warrant. Before I take any other motions, I need to ask Mr. Rector as chairman of the planning board to please report for the record the planning board's favorable recommendation on this article. I know you don't even understand what I'm asking you because we never do this, but town council has suggested that the planning board needs to report its recommendation for the record. And your recommendation was favorable. I just need you to state for the record that the planning board records a favorable recommendation on the motion on article two. You learn something new every day, thank you. Exactly, but never a dull moment here. For the record, the planning board unequivocally supports such. Thank you. Thank you. Did, is that good, Mr. Giorgio? Yes. You're welcome. Ms. Fick Fitzgibbon? Thank you, Bonnie Fitzgibbon. Uh, I just have to say that it, with all the talk that's been going on, um, personally, I'll just say I feel like I'm a little bit hijacked here. We're, we're going to get it one way or another. We're going to get it either through 40B or through a development company. And I certainly understand the need for affordable housing on this island. So that said, uh, on a personal note, I also want to ask the Richmond Corporation if they have looked into the impact uh, of this development on the wastewater treatment plant, uh, on the infrastructure of Nantucket Island, uh, this is an extremely dense development. I know, I think earlier you said a little bit of density, uh, but I think this is gonna be a tremendous amount of density overload or certainly uh, is gonna increase the density a lot on Nantucket's infrastructure. And I'm wondering if you've looked into the impact of this development on Nantucket's uh, fragile uh, environment. 
Mr. Arminetti, she could probably just hand you the. There you go. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Moderator, thank you. It's a very good question um, and one that we have looked into in great detail over the last two and a half years since we've been planning and have owned the property. Um, let me point out one question about the density increase. Uh, there's a lot of facts and figures that are in the motions and the articles and that we've thrown around. There's maybe a misperception as to exactly how much density we're asking to increase in relation to the existing zoning. And again, I'll refer to Mr. Vorce if the community needs an independent confirmation of this. Under existing zoning, we can develop approximately 260 units on this property, 260. We're committed to contractually limiting ourselves in the memorandum of understanding to 325 units. So we're not doubling or tripling or quadrupling the density that we can develop on our property under this scenario. We're only asking for 60 additional units. We know in the context of Nantucket, that's still a lot of units and it's still something that needs to be looked at very, very carefully, but there has been a misnomer around in some of these discussions that we're exponentially increasing the density and that's just not the case. To the question that the lady asked, since about the second day we've been out here on the island, we've been working with Kara and her staff at the DBW, the new town engineer, Silvio Gennaro. We've had, I think, through you, Kara, no less than 12, 15 meetings at your office. Um, I see David Gray there, the senior plant operator, who's probably tired of hosting us at your office at this point. Um, we've hired a civil engineer to do an extensive analysis of the generation of all the wastewater and the water generation with the WWC. And all the analysis proves that we will generate a fairly substantial increase in wastewater. The good news is we have a existing sewer pumping station right across the street from us, across Old South Road, within the Noshop development that is owned and maintained by the town. That one is actually in pretty good shape. The one down near the airport, not so much so. Nonetheless, we have committed, and that document will be a contractual obligation in writing between us and the DPW and the selectmen in the very near future, to not just building the infrastructure within our property with private funds, with our money, but upgrading the entirety of that pumping station to the specifications of the DPW and their engineer for the long term. So the numbers, the way they work out, even with all of the entire development of our property under this higher density, with the commercial, the industrial, the retail that we hope to build, 20 to 25 to 30 years out, we're only gonna contribute three or four or five percent of the flow to that pumping station but we've committed to paying for 100% of the upgrades that are necessary. And that monetary figure right now is somewhere in the vicinity of $200,000. That will not just benefit our development and take care of all of our flow, but it'll be benefit all the properties around us within about half a mile for the long term. And we know it's the right thing to do. We understand we're coming in here. We're the new guys on the island. We wanna do the right thing. So we're not asking for NOSHOP to contribute to that. We're not asking for the Emporium across the street who just expanded their facility by a significant factor to contribute to that. We're gonna step up, make that commitment, and pay that bill. And it's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Turbini, I think. My name is Damien Turvini. I live on Skyline Drive and I'm very concerned. I know we need housing, but what about all of us? You know, I grew up in Dorchester. I work real hard. I could have built, I killed myself. And I said, I'll build in a two acre zoning area. I can't see where all the cars, the traffic, and the impact that's going to make on the surf side, which Bob Moody and so thought about years ago to make this nice community. And I feel like I'm building Dorchester right in my backyard. And they've already cleared a road coming into Skyline. Ed Lindbergh building a house on Skyline, trying to plant trees. Glacky had a road going into Webster. I can't see where everybody and anybody isn't going to just drive right through. And like someone said before, there's Old South Road's already a mess. And it sounds like no matter what we do, you guys are going to do this. I don't understand. The, the blackmail, I feel like I'm being threatened in all my life work that I've done. You know, everyone in that community, we all feel threatened. 
And I really hope that, that just in the need that we have, that there's other options, there's Tom Nevin. What about all this land that's everywhere, the old Navy Yard? Why is it so desperate that it be right in a two-acre zoning area? Thank you. Okay, Mr. McClure. A follow-up question, uh, somewhat related to the question the gentleman just had, but um, I haven't had an opportunity to review the the agreement between the uh, the town and uh, Richmond. But I just asked. I guess the first question would be: Is Richmond entering into that agreement as the current owner and in control of the entire Gowaki property? And if that is the answer to that is yes, then I have a follow-up question. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Good question, sir. We, we are in full control as the fee owner of the entire 32 acres that are subject of this zoning amendment. And if I may, maybe I can even anticipate your question. Of our own accord, we offered this, and the Board of Selectmen and Town Council being wise, uh, demanded that we also make the memorandum of understanding binding on any successors or assigns of the property. So anyone we sell the property to, whether that be tomorrow or 20 years from now, is subject to the same binding contract that we signed with the, the town. Thank you. My follow-up question is simply, uh, I'm not sure how much this particular Article 2, uh, how much property it relates to of the entire so-called Glowacki property, but if it's, are you in owners or in control of the entire Glowacki property? Uh, Madam Moderator, through you, no. the, the acquisition we made, uh, depending on how you want to characterize it, the Gowacki property, Wally World, et cetera. The entirety of that acquisition was about 65 acres, all in the core of this area in Old South Road, basically bounded by Old South to the north, Lover's Lane to the west, uh, Skyline Drive to the south, and Evergreen Way to the east. We also acquired a few properties that were located downtown and towards the waterfront. Those are kind of extraneous to this area. But this core area, we acquired the entire 65 acres we still own uh, about 55. We've sold off a handful, primarily of single family homes to local individuals. After we got those houses up to meet code, which was quite an undertaking as you can all imagine. Um, and then we've sold off about 10 or 12 commercial industrial lots along Greglin Avenue. So we don't own 100% of it anymore. That was never our intent. We were always gonna sell some properties out into the market to locals and if you are more interested in hearing some detail about who the buyers are and who the new users are of this land, we'd be glad to share that. They are, without exception, all locals who own businesses on the island, contribute to this community, and live here. It's the, the not so sexy part of our portfolio is that core of commercial industrial properties for day-to-day -day businesses of the island that this community rezoned with us in annual town meeting 2014, and that the planning board and the planning staff and the committee that was formed for the Noshop Crossing Area Plan advocated for so strongly and that we support so strongly. So we still own about 75% of it. And as Patty mentioned, in the context of long-term commitment to the island and management, we will own all of the entirety of the apartments, which is about 14 acres, and we'll own all the entirety of the single family houses, which will eventually be sold out as individual lots and homes to individuals, but we will continue to oversee that and control it through a covenant through the Homeowners Association. Okay, and so Thank my the, the final comment would be, um, then you are in control or responsible for uh, any of the activities that are currently going on in that property, including that property that's just behind uh, the, the uh, Skyline Drive uh, owner's property, including filling and the um, cut through to Sky, uh, two cut throughs to Skyline Drive. We're, it's a bit of a technical question. We're in control of remaining property that includes an existing paper street that cuts through from uh, our property at 20 Dave Kim Road to Skyline Drive. Three of those properties that directly front on Skyline Drive we have sold to individuals, including Mr. Lemberg for a single family home, uh, another individual at 48 Skyline Drive for an individual home. But we own basically all the land behind it that connects out to Skyline. 
including the paper street that we have started to improve as a street that would provide access to the Skyline Drive neighborhood so they wouldn't have to go all the way around Overdeer Farm Road to the airport intersection to get on Old South Road and to get into town. To that particular point and to the gentleman's question, which we are sensitive to, the traffic study that we're going to do, as Mr. Vorce has referenced a couple times, we'll look at this in great detail. But the good news for the Skyline Drive neighborhood is there's no huge demand driver in Skyline for people to go to. We're not close enough to Surfside and to the beach to have people use that as a direct cut through. And the route itself will be very circuitous. You'll have to drive off Old South Road, all the way down Dave Kim Lane, all the way across the pit property into a more circuitous road to get out to Skyline. I think in real life what's going to happen is it's going to become a very convenient access point for the people who live on Skyline Drive in that area in Woodland Drive, but really for very few other people. But the traffic study will bear that out and will be responsible for that and the planning board and the planning staff will be responsible for that in all the hearings that will occur. And if the numbers show that that impact is going to be too great on the neighborhood, the planning board won't let us have a road there and the planning staff won't recommend it. And we're comfortable with that process and the community has that protection both in the law and the bylaw and in the contractual agreement that we just signed with the Board of Selectmen. That's the most significant portion of this agreement and this approach to do this local control, voluntary, collaborative process is we're not relying on a bureaucrat on Beacon Street in Boston to tell us how to run this thing. It's all of us in the room, it's all of us in the community. Thank Thanks. you. Ms. Johnson? Joanne Johnson. Are there controls on the resale of the affordable lots or are those homeowners able to resell at fair market value? And if there are controls, are those in, this, in the form of a permanent deed restriction? Thank you through you, Madam Moderator. Very good question. Uh, there are absolutely all the affordable house, housing units that are going to be sold will be restricted through a deed restriction that exactly matches the legally binding deed restrictions that you see with the Nantucket Covenant home and that you see with any of the state affordable housing. So those will be recorded against the property. They'll be enforceable. And in fact, even though this is not being processed as a 40B project, we're going to enter into the same binding monitoring that Ms. Barrett talked about voluntarily to make sure there can be no violation and people can't go off and sell those homes for excess profit. And at the moment, we are looking to retain Housing Nantucket to serve that function. They're qualified under the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, Mass Housing Department to be a, a qualified monitor for that purpose, and we're talking about retaining for that purpose. So again, even that portion of the project, we're using local control a local organization that you know, the board of directors that you deal with and that are your neighbors and Ann Cuspa. We're not using a consultant out of Boston. We're not using a law firm out of Boston. We're using a Nantucket firm for a Nantucket project. Oh, and Patty just made a good point that I glossed over during my initially incompetent presentation. Um, the affordability that we're offering here will be contractually perpetual in perpetuity for all those affordable units being both the single family and the rentals. And that will be contractual through these deed riders, and it's set forth, as town council could confirm, in one of the first or second provisions in this MOA. Most of the 40B projects that are done in the state now are only for 30-year commitments. We're willing, day one, to make a perpetual commitment to this community for that affordability. Guaranteed. The gentleman on the brown sweater. Hello. Uh, Mark Palmer. Uh, just wondering if you could quickly comment on what's being done uh, to minimize the electric demand, you know, national grid. Uh, what's the projected uh, draw on the electrical system and so on? Sure. Madam moderator, through you. Yes. Um, we've started to look into that in some more detail. Uh, we've had some preliminary discussions with national grid and with the town's energy coordinator, uh, Lauren Sinatra, who's been very involved and proactive and is going to continue to be so. We don't know the exact development plan yet, so we don't have exact loads, but that will be part of the studies and the analysis that we're going to submit to the planning board through the planning board special permit process, and all of that will be laid out in detail. But I will say, for a relatively small town, and we at the Richmond Company do work all over the Northeast, from New Jersey to Maine, large towns, suburban towns, small towns, 
for a relatively small town and given the geographic isolation of the community, there's a very sophisticated infrastructure in here in place with Lauren and her department and we're gonna work closely with her and that department and with National Grid. We talked at great length during the discussions with the Board of Selectmen over the last couple weeks about energy efficiency and trying to make those houses and apartments be as efficient as possible and to try and conserve as much as possible those important resources and we're committed to doing that. Thank you, Mr. Glidden. Right behind you. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Richard Glidden. Once again, I promised myself I wouldn't speak. But, um, I've been practicing real estate law on this island for 41 years, and I think I've probably been to more planning board meetings than any living person <laughs> anywhere. More planning board meetings on Nantucket, anyhow. I think and, John McLaughlin would take exception well, with that. It'd be, it'd be close. <laughs> and over those 41 years, every time there's a meeting or discussion about a subdivision, we always, lip service is paid to affordable housing, but that's all that's ever been done for 41 years. And here we are in 2015 and we have a real problem. And this, the extra load on the infrastructure and all these issues which the planning board has to deal with. No, there aren't people lining up on Hyannis to come here. The people are here. We have thousands, well, it's thousands, hundreds of people who don't have a place to live. And it's unbelievable, it's outrageous that a community like this can be in this situation. And now we've got a guy, listen, Richmond's not doing this because they're nice people. They want to make a buck. And the, I'm sure they will make a buck if they do this the right way. But they're going to make a buck either way, and they'd rather work with the town and get us some housing and begin to deal with a problem that no one has ever wanted to deal with for the whole 40 years that I've been practicing law. And I think we should move ahead, recommend this, and go home. Okay, Mr. Cohen? Okay, so Mr. Cohen has called the question. Um, that's not debatable. It requires a two-thirds vote, a yes vote. will end debate. A no vote will not adopt that motion. We'll go back to discussing the motion on Article 2. So all the, it does require a two-thirds vote. A yes vote adopts the motion, and we go right to a vote on the article. A no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor of moving the question on Article 2, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Okay. <laughs> so I declare that that is adopted by a two-thirds vote. Now we're on the main motion on Article 2. It's the motion as printed in the warrant with no um, changes. This does require a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. I declare that that is adopted by a two-thirds vote. Okay, Article 1. Article 1 starts on page 1, continues to page 2, where the planning board motion is, and continues to page 3 with the finance committee comment um, that we read in at the beginning of the meeting. As discussed um, with the last article, both the planning board comment and the finance committee comment are informational only. What you'll be voting on is the main motion of the planning board, which ends um, on page three with the words and filed herewith at the office of the town clerk. I recognize Chairman Barry Rector of the planning board for the purpose of making that motion. Is there a second? That motion is made and seconded, and just to get it over with early, Mr. Director, will you state that the planning board is recommending favorable action on Article 1? 
Thank you very much. So, discussion on Article 1. Who wants to start us off? Mr. Lowell, I think you called this. Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. I just want to thank everyone for bearing this in the evening together. This has been a great discussion, and I, as I said at the beginning, this is a companion article with the previous article, so I would ask to move the question and you, vote positively on this article. Well, you can't move the question after you've had oh. all that stuff okay. to say. But, Sorry. But let's okay. see, what does Mr. DaCosta have to say? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Two locals. Thank you. All right. So I guess I'll just take a quick vote on the motion to move the question. We'll just go right to a vote. If that's adopted, right to a vote on Article 1. Otherwise, we'll have a discussion. So just on the motion to move the question, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That is adopted by a declared two-thirds vote. On Article 1, the motion is as printed in the warrant. It does require a two-thirds vote. A yes vote will adopt the motion. A no vote will defeat the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. I declare that passes as a declared two-thirds vote. Thank you very much. And I will recognize Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. DaCosta, for the purpose of making a final motion to dissolve the 2015 special town meeting. My favorite three words, Madam Moderator. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous. Thank you very much.